And joining us here at TVO in the William G. Davis studio is William G. Davis, 18th Premier of the province of Ontario, and finally in that chair, which I've been trying to get you into for months and months and months. Well, no, longer than that, but go ahead. That is true. <laughs> Uh, let's go through a bit of a resume here of your political career, and then I'm going to come back with some questions. Mr. Davis, it was 50 years ago today that you got elected for the first time. June 11, 1959, you were elected the backbench MPP for Peel Riding. In 1962, you became Minister of Education for almost 10 years. As the minister, you oversaw the building of an unprecedented number of new schools, new universities, the community college system. In 1971, you became the 18th Premier of Ontario and won four consecutive elections. 1971 a majority, a minority in 75, a minority in 77. Less, less of a minority. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, and then a recaptured majority in 1981. As Premier, you of course oversaw the repatriation of the Constitution, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, full public funding for separate schools, you stopped the Spadina Expressway, and you, com you created this TV station in which we sit today. You left politics in 1985, became a council at Tories, sitting on numerous boards, and just to prove nobody's perfect, you love the Toronto Argonauts. Now, let's go back to 50 years ago today. What do you remember about that night? Well, listen, I remember so much that it's going to take us the whole hour. And we you haven't answer, got the whole hour. Oh, I don't we have, have the other whole people hour. who want to come oh, in, too. Oh, yeah, that's, that's too bad. <laughs> I can go back to time. It was a very difficult election you for me. You almost lost. Almost lost. I won the nomination December 58. Tom Kennedy had held the riding from 1919 till 59, except for three years. And it was, should have been a shoe-in. But then somebody in Ottawa, by the name of John George Stephen Baker, decided to cancel the Avro Arrow. Which was in your writing. Uh, right, in the great village of Malton. 14,000 employees, the more majority of whom lived in uh, my writing as a result. Listen, I can recall the only big meeting the Liberals ever had in that writing up to that point. Who was the guest speaker, the leader of the opposition? No, test pilot for the Arrow. Huh. That's who brought the multitudes out. So you won by about 1,200 votes that night. Yes, and three and a half years later, we won by some 13,000. In the interim, John Pallett, our Tory federal member, lost, as did John Hamilton and York West and Sandy Best and Holton, all uh, over the arrow. I'm told that after Mr. Diefenbaker pulled the plug on the Avro Arrow, you went to see Leslie Frost, the Premier, and you said to him something like, this is going to cause me a lot of difficulty, and Mr. Frost mm -hmm. then picked up the phone and called the Prime Minister in your presence. What happened on that phone call? Uh, I, I can't use the same language as occurred when he hung up after the phone call. Uh, I'd always had Mr. Frost on a bit of a pedestal, and in his call to the Prime Minister of this country, uh, he was not totally respectful. <laughs> in other words, he uh, sort of uh, was semi-critical. In fact, he was quite critical of what he Did had he done. Did he swear? Uh, he used language that we didn't use in our uh, dining room at home. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Now, you were 29 when you won that election. Yes. Did you... And, of course, the guy who you replaced had been Premier. Did you have any thoughts at that time, at age 29, that maybe I, too, could be Premier someday? No, except the guy who was covering it for the Cooksville Review had a picture at Tom Kennedy's 80th birthday party with Frost and myself, and underneath he wrote, past, present, and future. So maybe but he, it, was, he was biased. So maybe <laughs> it did occur to you then? No, it occurred to him. It occurred to him, <laughs> okay. Let's move forward. You won a big majority in 1971 after you took over from John Robarts, but four years later you almost lost the government entirely. You survived with a minority, and I want to know what was the biggest adjustment from going from senior cabinet minister, uh, you know, you were education, which was like health today. They had all the money back then. Senior minister to being the premier. Biggest adjustment. Well, it wasn't that great an adjustment because I've been part of the cabinet for nine years. Uh, the people I asked to join me in cabinet when I became the leader of the party, a number of them had been in cabinet, so I knew them all well. I think the biggest adjustment was realizing that when the election came, I had responsibility not only for the ministers and the members of caucus, but all of the other candidates who were running for us. And that added the burden, no question about it. Uh, the adjustment in terms of the operation of the government, not too great because I had been there. But, but you were 41 when you became Premier. Yeah, but I was, was old too for young? my age. You were old for your age. <laughs> Before, you didn't feel too young at 41? No, I didn't feel too young. I mean, listen, if I felt too young, I was Minister of Education some nine years before that. Uh, listen, the only thing I'd taught was Sunday school. And, uh, <laughs> and yet we had, I think, 
probably nine of the greatest years in the history of education in this province. Not to do with me, but it was growth, enthusiasm, people wanting to participate. I mean, that's when TVO was created. Mm. I mean, that's what has given you a great career opportunity. I owe it all to you, don't yeah, I? No question about that. <laughs> and I had to pay you a dollar, as I recall, on a certain uh, bet well, on the Argonauts. Well, like I said, nobody's perfect. Nobody's I bet perfect. Ticats, I, you I, bet Argos, I'm, and you lost that yes, time. Yes, I'm willing to bet again for the season, but we won't mention that on the program. We'll hold that off for yeah, now. Okay. There, there's another anniversary of sorts tomorrow. 25 years ago tomorrow, you stood up in the legislature and announced that you were, if I may put it this way, repudiating your previously held views on separate school funding and were in fact going to f offer full public funding to separate schools all the way to the end of grade 13. Can you give us any further insight today as to why you did that? Yes, I, and repudiation is not the right word. I mean, you're very good with English language. We're all entitled to have a change of mind, but it wasn't a repudiation. In 71, it was very firm, no extension. I'd had the bishop's brief. John Robarts, when he left, said, I'd left you with the bishop's brief in Spadina. Two simple problems. <laughs> and we went through a process. People forget something, though. In the mid-60s, I was Minister of Education when the foundation tax plan was passed. You don't remember it, but that was the plan that put the separate schools on a much more equal basis up to the end of grade eight uh, with respect to funding, uh, the commercial assessment. That was a step that really, I think, entrenched the separate schools, certainly at the end of grade eight. Then we made grades nine and 10 early in the 70s, and actually it left us with 11, 12, and 13. So this was more a continuation it of was. your thinking. Yeah, and you know, you, you had to really come to a decision. Are we gonna have a single school system, which incidentally a lot of people would have supported, or are you gonna be fair and equitable with what was the public separate school system. Now you've heard the story about the young people from Leger coming while I was cutting the lawn, yes, et cetera. On Main Street uh, in Brampton. On Main Street in Brampton, asking me how come we have to pay a fee if we want to go to Brampton Centennial? And I had no answer. I couldn't go to the British North America Act and all the rest of it. For them, it wasn't fair. I had already made up my mind that the time had come, this population in the province was such that I thought it would be reasonably acceptable and I knew it was, in conscience, the right thing to do. Okay, here's the follow-up then. Larry Grossman, one of your former ministers, mm -hmm. once told me that you having made this decision, mm -hmm. that he thought you were the only person who could sell is not the right mm -hmm. word, but get it through without kind of society going mm -hmm. through upheaval. And that when you decided to retire in 1984 mm -hmm. and Frank Miller took over, and Frank Miller obviously was not the guy to get it through, mm -hmm. uh, that meant trouble. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you ever wish you'd hung on, stayed to fight mm. that 85 election so that the kinds of upheaval mm. that did eventually take place might not have happened? Yeah, the upheavals are exaggerated. The reality, there should not have been any upheaval. I mean, I saw the figures. I knew that a percentage of the people of Ontario were not enthused. Uh, that has been the case. It may be still the case today, but I think the numbers are much lower. Uh, I could have stayed, but I was relatively comfortable that the policy was right. Uh, every minister of the Crown voted for it. We didn't have a vote. We're all supportive in Cabinet, except one. Uh, I won't tell you who it was. I can tell you who it was. Yeah, well, you may know who it is. And his, I said to him... His I name's said, Norm Sterling. Yeah, and I said, Norman, if this is a fundamental matter of principle for you, I'll accept your resignation. And now listen, this is a lot of years. I haven't had that letter yet. No, I, he didn't resign. I'm teasing. He's I'm still teasing. there. He's, he's listen, celebrated he's his 32nd yeah. year in the legislature he, a couple days ago. He's a great member, a great member. No question about it. But he voted against it. Yes, he, I'm not sure he voted against it. He may have been absent. He wasn't in favor of it in yeah. cabinet. That much I do recall. Hmm. Yes. So no, no regrets about not sticking around to fight that and get that no, through. No, because it should not have been a significant issue. And if you look at the figures, it wasn't until about the last two weeks. And I tell you when it became an issue. Uh, the OSSTF sent a letter to the candidates. The candidate in our writing, a very nice young man, said, yes, I will review this. I think some question, would you take another look at it if you're elected? I'm right across the road from St. Mary's where Archbishop Pocock spent some time. <laughs> Within 24 hours, I knew about how that uh, letter had been answered. And I can tell you four days later, I heard from the Jesuit community in Hamilton. 10 days later, Cardinal Carter called and said, what is happening? because the fear had been uh, introduced that if uh, the Tories won again, maybe they would reassess it. In my view, Frank had no intention of reassessing it, but we didn't meet it. I'll say we meet it during the election campaign head on. Do you think now that uh, full funding has been extended to Catholics, 
that, uh, and your friend John Tory suggested this in the last campaign, mm -hmm. do you think all faiths have to be funded now in this province? I don't say they have to be funded. It's a very fundamental issue. And I think John would be the first one to tell you that he understood that this was a key issue during the campaign. I can only tell you back in the late 60s, as Minister of Education, I had a tentative agreement with the Jewish day schools. They were all in North York. Uh, the uh, then director, Dr. Minkler, was in support. We nearly had it done. And then a very able lawyer, a very fine person, came to me. He was representing the Jewish day school, said, you know, I don't think we can go ahead. I don't know whether it was because part of the agreement was uh, they had to accept non-Jewish students, mm. but uh, for whatever reason, it didn't happen, but it was very close. Okay. I can't tell you where it's going to go in the future. I let's, mean, that's up to you to speculate. I, we never do that here. No, no, of course not. <laughs> let's, let's talk about one of your, I, 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 I'll put it out there. I th the, the, the Constitution of this country mm. would not have been repatriated without your intervention at a key moment. Mm. I'll say it, and now we're going to play some mm. tape and see if others agree. Uh, Michael, here's Bill Davis on the Constitution. Roll tape, please. Every citizen of Ontario shares a common right to self-advancement, to balanced and stable government, to freedom, to justice, to equity and security as residents of a great province, a great province which has a key role to play in advancing the interests of a great nation. Here's, you don't get to talk yet. Here's some more background, because we have a lot of younger viewers and a lot of new Canadians who will not remember 1982. Pierre Trudeau moves to repatriate the Constitution with a Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Eight provinces are opposed. You representing Ontario and New Brunswick are in favor. There's this famous meeting in the kitchen where your Attorney General, Roy McMurtry, and Roy Romano from Saskatchewan, and Jean Chrétien representing Trudeau, hammer out a compromise. Still, Mr. Trudeau is not quite sold. So you pick up the phone and you call him. And Roy Romano, who was in that chair yesterday, picks up the story. Roll tape. I'm convinced that Premier Davis, at some point, either in that telephone conversation or shortly thereafter, communicated to Prime Minister Trudeau that unless he accepted the notwithstanding clause, simple majority, he had no choice but to pull out of his support for the Prime Minister. I, 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 now, he's never, I, I've tried to raise it with Premier Davis, Bill Davis, he's too discreet. He probably won't even tell you if, he was, if he's going to be on your show. I think that, in effect, amounted to an ultimatum. I don't think anybody who knows Bill Davis, this is a gentleman, a thoughtful person. I don't think he'd ever put it to him as an ultimatum, but I think the Prime Minister's hold card was gone because when Ontario pulls away, you've only got New Brunswick, it's game over. Is that right? I have to tell you a little story. <coughs> I apologize for my throat, but some months ago, Mr. McMurtry had a very lovely dinner at his place. Uh, the gentleman you just heard from was there. I always said to Romano, if he'd been born in Ontario, he would have been a progressive conservative. Uh, Jean Chrétien was there. I said, gentlemen, I may be writing a book. If I do, you three people will have to understand, in spite of all you have said, all you've said about yourselves that have written, will go totally down the drain, you'll understand. You were really just carrying papers for the first business. I mean, I had some fun <laughs> with them. Kretchen said to me that night, we heard there was a phone call. In fact, he checked with the prime minister. There was a phone call. He said, I don't know who made that phone call. I looked him straight in the eye, and I said, John, you really don't know who made the phone call light put on, and then he realized. Uh, but what people don't recall either is that Ontario took the position when Trudeau thought of going to Westminster by himself. Yes. I went to see him. Siegel was with me. We met in Sussex. And I said to the Prime Minister, you have to try once more. He kept saying, it won't happen. I said, I can't guarantee you'll, we'll go with you. I don't know what uh, Richard will do. But I take That's some Hatfield, credit. Richard Hatfield, New Brunswick. Yeah, I mm -hmm. take some credit for, in fact, having that uh, final conference. And it worked. I could tell you more about it, but I shan't burden your viewers. But Is the know, word ultimatum an appropriate word to use? I don't think ultimatum. It was a point of view. It was a fact. And it, but I could take you back. And this is what a lot of people don't understand, because I was being criticized for supporting uh, Mr. Trudeau's position. Go back to Victoria. You don't remember because you weren't born. But we had total unanimity in Victoria. Ontario had agreed with a slight change on the social policies. Uh, Robert Barassa was in support of it. This was in 70 or 71? 71, 71, in Victoria. Mm -hmm. and, and 
our position didn't change during those 10 years intervals. Well, okay, you, you don't want to call it an ultimatum, but when you have Pierre Trudeau on the other end of the phone and you say, look it, you've got to compromise on this notwithstanding clause, or Ontario may not be able to support you, what else would you call that? Uh, I, I'm not sure that was my exact language. All I can tell you is <laughs> the uh, tenor of the meeting was different the following day. And the only thing I feel badly about that whole issue was that uh, René Levesque was part of those people opposing. I don't think he knew until he got to the meeting that morning that, in fact, the views of the other ministers had changed. And they hung him out to dry. Uh, well, I, I felt badly for it. I didn't agree with him. So do you yeah. buy into this night of the long knives as it has come to be known in Quebec? Uh, I, I don't think there were any knives anywhere. I think it was a mistake, perhaps. Uh, people may not have thought of it. Uh, listen, there was a lot of pressure on everybody. Uh, but I felt badly for Levesque. I disagreed with him totally. I have to tell you one story. I went there the first referendum. I went down to speak at the invitation of the uh, Montreal Chamber. Uh, my speech was pretty good. <laughs> French was better than Diefenbaker's, which doesn't say much. <laughs> Randy called the next morning. He said, Bill, I hear you made a great speech last night in Montreal. I said, well, that's good. He said, please come again. We went up two points in the polls last night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of person he was. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask you about something that Brian Mulroney mm -hmm. wrote about you in his memoirs. And we all know what the Big Blue Machine was. This was mm -hmm. this great backroom organization that somehow won four elections with you at the helm. And Brian Mulroney is said to have said in his <coughs> book, uh, I really want your support because I want that Big Blue Machine to help me win elections too. And he's quoted you as having said, Brian, I am the Big Blue Machine. Would you confirm that story for us here? Uh, no, I, and I, would, I wouldn't disagree with Brian on his recollection of that conversation. But the reality is, I said to Brian, A, the word machine is grossly overstated. You're talking about a group of people who had a common interest, a common purpose. That was the machine. I mean, you know some of them. Some of them have passed on. I said to Brian, I am part of the organization. I will help. And if I help, the others will help. That's a far more delicate way of saying you, you, it. You, are, you have this uh, annoying habit of being extremely modest over the years, and I'm really trying to get you to kind of just get out there a little bit and say, you know what, Pakin, yeah, I really am the big blue machine. That's no. what you said to him. Yeah, but no, that's what he said I said to him. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a difference. <coughs> okay. A uh, couple of more minutes, because otherwise uh, your friend's over Listen, on the other I side of the room. You, I warned you at the beginning of this. I might want to take the whole hour. This is my <laughs> studio. <Go ahead. laughs> Historians constantly reevaluate history. Do you wonder what they will do with your time in office? No, I, I, I wonder perhaps to a certain extent. I don't worry about it because I, um, I am a modest person. I really am. But I do know that in the nine years I was Minister of Education, they were perhaps the most exciting, uh, where more things were done in terms of curriculum, in terms of institutions, in terms of teacher education. I feel very comfortable. As Premier, I saw patriation, I saw the Charter, I saw the Ministry of the Environment created, family law reform, uh, corporation. In fact, when I joined a law firm, I told them, I can't practice law with you, but I'm here because I passed more legislation that enabled your profession to make money than any <laughs> single Premier in the history of Ontario. And that's factually uh, correct. Is that something you want to boast about? Uh, no, I uh, <laughs> don't because people will say there's far too much legislation. <laughs> yes. But no, I'm, I'm comfortable I guess because of the support of my family and the friends that I have, that uh, uh, historians will do what they want to do. But I am comfortable that I did my best. I made the judgments that I thought were right. And on the occasion, I may have made a mistake. I can't think of any, but there may have been one. Right no, no. Maybe the guys on the other side of the studio will <laughs> well, think of a few. As you think about what the essence of Ontario was 50 mm -hmm. years ago today when you got elected, is that essence, whatever it is, still existing today? I think some of it is. I think people are still concerned about the quality of life. I think they're concerned about the principles. I think they're concerned about issues of violence, etc. But to say Ontario is the same as it was when I first entered politics was wrong. The diversity is obvious. It has been one of the great strengths, but also an important thing for our party to reach out to the new Canadians, which we not, haven't always done effectively. And, and we've paid a price for that on occasion. But uh, fundamentals don't change. Honesty doesn't change. Principle doesn't change. Uh, some degree of respect for your political opponents. I mean, what I don't understand is the sometimes degree of confrontation that takes place. I mean, uh, you're going to have somebody on this program who is philosophically misguided. 
but I was with him the other night at Queen's University. That'd be he Conway, I guess. Yeah, right? he couldn't mm -hmm. have been kinder. I mean, if Stephen Lewis were on the program and some of my right-wing friends will say, oh, he was a friend of yours, I thought so. I mean, we're helping him with, with his foundation. Bob Ray is a friend. Uh, Elmer Sofa from the Liberals. We could go battle one another in the house. We could go out and have dinner together. I mean, I think That doesn't happen anymore, does it? Doesn't happen much. And, and we used to have fun. I have to tell you one story. When Donald McDonald got up before the orders of the day, and uh, some will remember this. It's the former NDP leader. Yeah, and, and he really went after me because he had received a letter from the Conservative Party of Ontario fundraising. And he went on at some length. I was sort of nonplussed, but I got up and said, Mr. Speaker, I apologize to the honorable member. Very recently, we acquired the subscription list for Playboy magazine, <laughs> and that's how we got on the list. The house collapsed, he collapsed. And, you know, it was the kind of fun that you can have on mm -hmm. occasion. Yeah. I want to ask you one last thing, and this is a bit of a touchy-feely question, so you'll forgive me here. You're going to be 80 years old next month. More yesterday's than tomorrow's. Do you think much about your mortality at this stage of the game? Listen, I have 12 grandchildren. They keep you from thinking too much about your mortality. Uh, no, and I, you know, you go back to your other question. I don't know how long I will continue to, uh, to be here. Uh, all I know is I've been involved in every single election, federal and provincial, since I retired. I am interested in what's happening in Ottawa at the moment. I'm interested in what's happening at Queen's Park. Uh, I hope I continue. How long I continue uh, is not totally in my hands, uh, Steve. But I don't worry about what the historians will say because I'm being very modest, but I am not uncomfortable with what we accomplished in the 25 years in public life. Mr. Davis, it was a great pleasure having you in the studio that bears your name today. We're grateful that uh, you could spare the time for us, and we hope this is not your last visit to TVO. Thanks so much. You're very welcome, and it's because of you I'm here. You're very kind. Uh,